Welcome to the State of Mind Virtual Speaker Series. This series has been developed to provide education and support to youth, caregivers, and educators during this challenging time. This series is a collaboration between two local nonprofits, One in Five and MindPeace, and various community mental health partners. We're glad you're here to educate yourself and to learn how to keep your brain in a healthy state of mind. I wanna welcome everybody tonight. Um, thank you for being with us. And um, tonight we have with us Dr. Dan Nelson, who is the Medical Director of Child Psychiatry at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And he is going to talk to us about care for caregivers. So Dan, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And I wanna express my appreciation for the invitation from One in Five and MindPeace uh, to talk with you this evening. Uh, I've also worked for the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, and they've helped me to learn a lot about the topic we're going to talk about. But I, I have to admit, I was looking over to the slides that I was uh, potentially going to use, and the first time I gave these slides was shortly after the Oklahoma City bombing. And to date myself then, that was before PowerPoint was a thing. And the slides are all actual slides in a projector. So it's um, been a long time. Um, at any time during the, this, this uh, webinar, we really welcome you to either type or if, uh, if you'd like, even interrupt, because there's nothing I'm going to say that's so important that a good question uh, wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and if the participants who are here, if they should want to just share uh, your background, um, Kathleen told us about her background, and I... Uh, Paige, I don't know if your microphone's working yet. And the third participant, I just have an M-A-K. Anybody want to tell me what type of work you do? Or... All right. Well, let me proceed. Um, and I'll try to, I'll try to make this uh, applicable on many levels. But each of us, during a time of crisis, and un unfortunately, COVID-19 represents a, uh, a marathon of disaster or, or uh, a challenges that go with stressful situations. It's not necessarily a disaster for everyone, but the overall scope of what's happening, I think we could consider a disaster. And so as we look at that, who's most effective, affected by disasters, um, we can see, huh, that's weird, that there are circles of influence. Well, this is interesting, speaking of disasters. I'm not doing that. My slides are taking off on their own. So if you look at this slide, you can see that here's, here's maybe this is your life or the life of somebody you are, are caring for and thinking about, because there are parallels between how we think about the care for ourselves and how we think about the care for people. So the first one of those is how much are we being affected by this? Uh, and so we can measure that in kind of a degree of exposure, if you will. So in these factors, there's geographic proximity, there's psychological proximity, and there's social proximity, and then there's populations at risk. So geographic proximity is if, if the neighbor were to die next door, uh, from COVID, but you wouldn't necessarily be close to them, but just that that's right next door ends up having a deeper psychological impact um, from that geographical perspective, perspective. Also, if my neighbor was somebody with whom they're my age and maybe they go to the same place of work and I identify with them as a person, that would amplify my response. And so this particular attribute can be like, there can be a a senior who dies in a high school and the freshman who like liked the sports that they were in or looked up to them, they're gonna have more of an impact from that. Uh, social proximity, obviously family and friends, boom, that hits hard, but also people with whom we might share a classroom with or they might attend the same uh, religious organization, whatever, how we identify with them. Populations at risk, if we think about our the people we work with having previous trauma, mental illness, anything like that. Um, substance abuse can make a person more vulnerable. If I'm going through a time in my life where maybe my child is ill or I'm going through a divorce, mm -hmm. these kinds of stresses are gonna be amplified. And so if you can, if you remember your old, 
I'm sorry. Every time I hit the advanced, it's trying to go show. It wants to show you all my slides. So, um, if you, this is going to be real interesting. All right, we're going to try this a different way. But if you look at the member Venn diagrams from when we were all in um, high school, and the geographic pro proximity and population at risk, if those overlap, you get kind of that large. Hopefully, you can see my my cursor, this large thing. If they're psychological, you get this. But if they're all three, those are people who are really most vulnerable. And so it's just worth thinking about. And if I find myself in that situation, obviously I will be more affected. Um, we're gonna distribute the slides. So if I go quickly through some of these slides, just forgive me, but this slide is really just about that PTSD and trauma is pretty common in people at large, but during times of disasters, it actually goes up quite a bit if the population. So throughout the United States at this time, given that we have the highest incidence of problems with COVID, I think we can anticipate that it's gonna hit people here. We're gonna have a higher rate just from COVID. And if other bad things are happening in somebody's life, even if it's my life, then I'm going to have a bigger impact. And therefore, I'm going to need more, more help and support. I need to give myself more time to, um, to reorganize, to recuperate, and to heal. So then, this is just a silly slide, but I like silliness a little bit. So I don't know. This, if you remember the far side, this was the crisis clinic. You can't really see the name, but you know they're obviously in crisis. And stress, we're talking about all this kind of stress. Oh, the irony. All right, we'll move on. So the key concepts or definitions here. Um, stress actually is something that can be actually quite advantageous to us. Most of us look for a certain balance of stress. If our lives are too um, kind of even and wonderful, um, they're less interesting, in fact. And if you've ever gone on a really great vacation, but kind of long to be back home and long to be back at work even, uh, that kind of shows you if stress is too low, it's not as, as, as interesting. But there's a level where stress builds that's beyond what we're intended to cope with, and that becomes distress. And so with that, you have stress plus dysphoria that begins to lead, if, it, if unrecognized and then, uh, addressed, you end up having uh, loss of functioning. Uh, suffering is what we, it's a, just a term we use for severe distress. Um, and then compassion is part of what we need to be mindful of because when we become compassionate and we join with people, when we become empathetic, it, we don't have to be directly affected by, this, by the events that that person went through in order to experience um, a residual distress, residual effects of that. So if you're hearing a lot of people talk about what's very difficult in their lives, or you're worried about, you're used to seeing these kids in your classroom and you're seeing these kids struggle, that in itself can create a feeling of, of further stress and maybe even distress in us. Um, so then we get to this concept of compassion fatigue, which, which is most of what I'm gonna try and articulate in the first half of our webinar is that, that there's actually stages we go through that can help us understand compassion fatigue and hopefully know when we need to spend uh, more time on taking care of ourselves. Burnout is the descriptive term where you actually have experienced so much compassion fatigue that you now are really having trouble functioning, not just in your job and the role that you have in caring for others, but even just taking care of yourself. Burnout can really, people leave their professions over burnout. And it's a huge loss. So we don't want people to ever experience burnout if we can, because people often train much of their life to have a career. And uh, to experience that is not only very negative for that person who experiences it, but for people around them. So um, compassion fatigue usually involves this sense of idealization that brings us into a closer connection to a problem. So. Um, there's a sense of, <clears throat> I can do this, I can be okay. And as you can see, there's kind of a knight in shining armor. Uh, I know what I'm getting into. I can do it even if I'm alone, I'm powerful. And you might think about the things that, that tell you that you're okay. I had great training. I have a wonderful faith. I can, I've been through this before. I've got this. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the thing that draws us toward danger. <laughs> 
if you will. And thank goodness that there are people who want to do that. We need people who want to move toward the, the, the problem instead of run away from it. Um, and this is an overview of, oh, I did it again. This is an overview of oh, the whole talk. This is hilarious. So here you can see the idealist, idealized phase over to the left, and then, then it has the other phases, irritable phase, withdrawal phase, exhaustion, and pathology or renewal and resiliency. So they're, they're at the end of this, there's a way to get back. But on that curve, you can see it's a typical Gaussian curve. They're kind of depicting um, that green zone is kind of where we're either inactive or we're not very stressed. I wouldn't call this the ideal phase, but it's in this phase where we don't feel very taxed that we jump into things. The irritability phase um, or the yellow phase in there probably is not the irritability phase. It's a different curve. This is where we begin to perform really well. Actually, this is optimum stress. But right at the peak, you can see you begin to experience fatigue. You begin to feel like, uh, can I do this as well? tomorrow as I did it today. Because as you move toward the exhaustion, you're losing functioning. Performance is on the left side of that diagram and stress is on the base of it. So you get to exhaustion, then you get to anxiety, panic, and anger, and burnout. So uh, I'm gonna go through the things on the left with a little bit more detail. But let me also kind of give you another paradigm. Make sure I do this in the right way. So the quick pause is, if we each were to look at ourself in the center of this, this, it's almost a mandala. There's all these different spheres with which we will gather our strengths or will experience vulnerability. So for instance, we could pick any one of those aspects. If I'm uh, on, in the standpoint of independence, there's separation, there's disengagement, there's straying, and then there's self. But independence, there's, there's some elements in there that they don't describe very well, where I feel myself to be self-reliant and capable. Um, in relationships, you have attachment, recruiting connection, but there's also the negative aspects of that, which could be disconnection, not feeling uh, you're able to uh, communicate well or connect with the people who matter the most to you. Uh, initiative, you see there's that, that, do I take energy and give it into a project? With humor and creativity, they kind of put those together. Am I able to be playful? Am I able to experience what I'm doing as enjoyable and interactive? Uh, there's the aspects of morality, there's aspects of insight, how well we can recognize ourselves and how we're doing. So just keep those in mind as we move through these phases. So here's the idealized phase, and it is... Um, High energy, committed, it's all those things we talked about there. The ideal body measurement tool, that's that guy for me. You know, there he is, I can do this. I look just like him, I'm sure you've noticed. Um, this is where you feel creative, you're enthusiastic and you feel no problemo, but irritable phase, and this was me yesterday when I was a little upset. Um, maybe it was before yesterday, but you get short, snappy, irritable, uh, you may find that you will mock an interaction or a person's tone, humor turns into hostility, and you're more likely to begin making mistakes. This is when we begin to go down that curve. Next, you have this withdrawal phase. And this is where it's beginning to, to be too much. And whether a person in, is intentionally doing this or not, they tend to pull back in a way that now you got fatigue, withdrawal, dehumanization of yourself and others. Enthusiasm burns out. You become neglectful of your own needs, your family's needs, your coworkers, avoidance of emotion, of interacting, connecting, and your inner world can become quite sad and even full of guilt because you know, oh, I'm not taking care of my kids in the same way as I should, but I just want to come home and go to bed or I, you know, I don't want to engage or I'll just do this, but I'm going to do it quietly and I'm not going to talk to my family about what I'm going through. Now, let me mention too, that when you have a heavy burden, let's say it's at work, you might have this difficult dilemma because talking to the people you love uh, about it is a way of decompressing, but you also don't want to expose them to your potentially traumatic environment. 
So there is this, this, this important balance in that uh, regard. So exhaustion phase, now hopelessness evolves to anger and even rage, hostility, critical and defeatism kind of thinking, disdain for the challenge. And what anhedonia means is that things I used to love doing, if I love walking my dog or I love you know, riding horses, even that doesn't seem to have the uh, excitement that it once did, almost did it again. So uh, pathology and victimization versus maturation and resiliency. So what happens now is we either learn from these things and in the way that um, uh, Nietzsche talked about that which doesn't destroy me makes me stronger. If you learn things, a better way to take care of yourself in all this then you begin to be stronger and you function better. And that's where the maturation and resiliency. If we don't learn things about ourselves or about the system and how the system needs to be more human and treat us better, then we can become uh, overreactive, leave the profession. We can end up with physical illness and our symptoms can begin to perpetuate. And that's of course what post-traumatic stress disorder is a chronic disorder. There's acute stress disorder, but if it goes beyond um, a number of weeks, it becomes a chronic problem and that's quite challenging. There are warning signs that we're having trouble. A lot of those you might've heard in the, the outline so far, but you know, difficulty concentrating, withdrawal hostility, changes in appetite, uh, physical appetite, sexual appetite, exhaustion, depression, uh, even euphoria can be a sign that things are not going well if it's kind of out of the blue. <clears throat> and then self-medicating. I've done a lot of work with first responders. They often, you know, say, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, but I have to drink two pots of coffee in the morning to get going. <laughs> or four liters of pop. I mean, it, it, I, I've heard that. And that's a whole lot of caffeine. Uh, a dangerous amount because it can affect your heart. So... And then self-entitlement can be one of those. So early warning, sleep is really important. It's important for recovery and it's also reported as a barometer for how we're doing. It's one of the primary causes of compassion fatigue slipping into an overdrive and causing lots of trouble. Also, we have sleep disruption as a key symptom when the pattern's disrupted for extended periods of time, it's gonna affect your mood, it's gonna affect your ability to function. So how to reestablish normal sleep. And that can be really challenging for people. And I think and sometimes that's what is a trigger for some people's substance use and abuse is that they will go to um, things that seem adaptive, but actually in the long run, they're not adaptive. Alcohol, various drugs, some things like uh, Benadryl, for instance, they work for a couple of nights, but after you use them for four or five nights, they actually will not help with sleep. And if you don't take them, now your sleep is even more problematic. Uh, melatonin is, that, is not that way. Uh, there's not what they call habituation. So melatonin is a very safe thing. But the weird thing about melatonin, the less you take, the better it works. So if you want to optimize melatonin, try to get the one milligram pills. Take one, you know, half an hour, hour before bed. But if that doesn't work, take, a, take the first one after dinner and then the next one before you go to bed. That's one way to really, there's other medications that don't habituate. So um, the key ones are probably called trazodone. Trazodone is very good for sleep without, and it's an it's a antidepressant, but it's, it works for sleep in a really, really low doses. Um, if you have things like restless leg, there's a medicine called Neurontin or Gabapentin. And we could go into more detail about sleep, but um, that's another topic. So how do you get through this in the way that's healthiest for um, yourself and your family? First, try to know yourself, try to know what's stressful, try to know what's, what's how do you um, uh, recharge? Who do you talk to? There's, you know, there's gonna be people you talk to in your life who you feel like you have to talk to them, but you don't necessarily feel better after you talk to them. And then there's people you talk to and, and you can open your heart and they help you problem solve and they're very, very helpful. Um, know your own limits and have a self-care strategy. So we'll, we'll hopefully talk about these more in just a minute. Um, Self-examination, there's something I uh, teach to medical students called the daily psychological inventory. Um, 
and that that could be another talk for that matter. But it's it, it's really about examining each of your uh, primary emotions. There's seven primary emotions. When did you feel them in a given day? Who do you really care about? When did they feel the primary emotions? Um, and then what is your tasks for the day and how do you feel about those tasks? Um, resourcing your supports, uh, recreation, what is it you find? And that, you know, my daughter, she loves to knit. Um, and so she's really good at knitting and what they call handwork. She learned it in school. Um, so oddly enough, you know, it doesn't have to be, some people want to go run. They want to have kind of large motor kind of thing. Other people just want to go for a walk, sometimes alone, sometimes with the person whom they feel they can open up to. It is good to have a buddy. If you're going to do, uh, like we were talking to Kathleen and uh, her situation being at school with 160 different teachers, it's important to have other teachers you can talk to who might be able to ratify, hey, is this working the way it should? And, and it's, what am I feeling? Is it reasonable? So recovery and resiliency, planning and intentionality, understanding what it takes for you to get better. The buddy system I just mentioned, understanding where your anxiety comes from. Sometimes anxiety can come from the, the uh, challenging event. I hate to use the term disaster over and over because we really haven't seen the disaster, but it may be coming. Um, how do you soothe yourself? Um, like I can come home from work and play the guitar and feel better. I can from I can go play tennis and I feel better. One's a little bit different. Um, I go for a walk with my wife. I feel a lot better. But I've I've got all these things that I try to do and I practice them quite a bit because my work has a lot of of um, things that could cause uh, what they call a contagion effect. It's it's you, I hear a lot of traumatic stories from kids all day. Um, so self-care, narrative, how do I think about what, what's going on? The, the stories we tell ourselves have a lot to do with how we feel. We know that from cognitive behavioral therapy, and this is well-researched. Uh, desensitization and reprocessing, if you've heard of EMDR, uh, that can be a, a technique. Let me also say that what is traumatic initially as we adapt to a situation. I used to work in an emergency room, and at first, the things I was seeing were really difficult. Uh, six months to a year later, they weren't so difficult because I'd become adapted to what I was seeing, and I became more able to be helpful because I wasn't experiencing such a strong emotional response. And then self-supervision, the ability to reflect on on yourself and what is what is your what are you capable of. So this again is that wheel when compassion and fatigue leaves the joy of caring returns. And I like this quote because it is a joyful thing to be able to take care of other people and see them get better. And uh, so many of us are in the role of being a significant helper. When you're a teacher and you're responsible for all those kids, especially when you get to junior high and high school where it's not one classroom, it's not just 25 or 30 kids, it's that times say five and having a uh, a connected relationship with 150 people in the course of an academic year is a, is a Herculean task. So, and especially now that things are going virtual and you know you want that, but is how is it possible is the question. So remember, you're not the only source, uh, not only for helping and healing for, for others, but also for yourself. There should, it should be okay to uh, lean on others and know that they can be a support to us when we're no longer uh, feeling our best. Um, when we get into uh, intensely um, powerful situations, disasters, the need is always greater than the available resources. Do not imagine you can fill um, the what everybody's going to need. It takes a team and it takes delegation. So, and it's, sometimes it's just enough to know I've done what I can do today and then I need to go home and I need to rest and then I'll come back and try again tomorrow. Um, use care and how you measure your successes. Sometimes we don't know how much we're doing when we do it. Um, sometimes we're preventing things from happening in the future, even though bad things have happened in the past. Uh, value small victories um, because this stuff like COVID, COVID's, you know, all the indicators now are COVID is not going to disappear. It'll be with us the rest of our lives in some form or another. 
And, and as, if you will, when influenza came out, it probably was just as dangerous as COVID has been. So as we get exposed and hopefully we get a vaccine, it'll, it'll mitigate it, but it's, it's, it's gonna be around for a long time. Um, please know that it's important to recognize the pain that other people you work with or you observe, even in your family, their pain is not your pain. And that recognizing that can be very important. There's another talk that we're gonna do a webinar about helping people cope with loss and uh, bereavement. And it's important to recognize that each of us are individuals and we experience the world in our own way. Um, you don't, it doesn't help to take this stuff home with you from work. It'll be waiting for you in the morning. If you can find a way to give yourself permission to release yourself from it. I always try to remind myself, work hard, play hard, and uh, take care of your spirit, your emotions, and your body. If you don't, it's harder to have anything left. So I had promised I'd try to do all this in 30 minutes and look at that. I, I have that on the clock. I think everyone's Nancy, muted. We okay. do have one question. Um, sure. Lisa would like to know, um, to hear your input about what the latest EMDR research tells us. So um, EMDR is a uh, technique that was developed by France, Francis Shapiro. Um, it might be Francine, I might be getting this wrong. I actually attended some of her coursework. Um, I will tell you this, I think their research is complicated because they were asking people not to do research unless they were endorsed by the people with the MDR. And that's a real departure from how medicine typically works. Research in medicine doesn't, like if I'm testing uh, a medication, I shouldn't have to ask the drug company to approve everything. So I will say that, but by and large, EMDR has, um, it has a mixed success. It works really well for some people and doesn't work well for others. Um, and so, and, and that's not unusual. I mean, most treatments are like that. Uh, I do think it works best for people who have probably already had pretty good luck processing their trauma because it's not, the technique is one to use a visual stimulus and it's what, what Francine Shapiro talks about is this cross lateralization of the brain. She, she got the concept from um, rapid eye movement during dreaming where we know the brain is probably processing what's happened during the day. And her question was, if I ask people to talk about their problems while their eyes are going back and forth, does it improve how they integrate the story um, and how they feel about it? And, and it does for some people and it doesn't for others. Um, in general, if you look at the medical literature on it, it's, it doesn't seem to be very kind in my mind. It's not, it's not as robust as, as if you look at the people who are doing it and them researching it in the way that they feel is important. Um, I do a lot of work with hypnotherapy and in my mind, it's very, very similar to that. So how the person who's doing the eye movements is talking to the individual who's doing that and what kinds of suggestions are being made to me has a lot to do with whether the outcome is successful. Cause it's, it, to me, it's almost like the, the, if you've seen the watch and the pendulum. So how good is hypnotherapy? Well, about as good as the person who's doing the hypnotherapy and how well the person who's doing it is how well the connection is. We know uh, research on psychotherapy and success has been profoundly uh, consistent about showing three factors that show success for psychotherapy. And this, this probably applies to EMDR. Um, the experience level of the clinician, as that goes up, they tend to be more successful. That's why you want people who are well-trained, <laughs> who stay with, with what they're doing. But I've seen people real early in their training do very well, so I'm not gonna dis disparage them. That the person has a theory and that they're using that theory. It, can't, it doesn't have to be one theory, but they have to have at least one and they have to know how to use it. Those patients do much better. But the third thing, which I think to be the major factor is does the clinician and the patient, do they both feel like 
this is a good connection and I'm hopeful that we're gonna have success. If either one of them don't feel that, then it's probably not a good fit. And if we're talking in the first two or three sessions. Now, after the first two or three sessions, what can often happen is as the clinician starts to ask more difficult and challenging questions, then people can get mad at the clinician and no longer feel they're the right person. That actually may mean that the clinician's doing a good job, but they might be moving too quickly. Um, at least that's what I teach the people I supervise. Is you, you wanna be careful not to move so quickly as to make it scary. But looking at you know patterns of challenging things and unconscious material is always hard. Hard for anyone. It's hard for uh, even the people training in becoming psychotherapists. Anybody else have a question they'd like to, uh, Dr. Nelson, to answer for you? I have a question. This is Kathleen speaking. Um, so within, you know, a week and a half or so, um, we'll be interacting with the students um, again through the screen. And I've never started a school year like this. Um, I've been teaching for 20 years, but you know, everybody at this point feels like a first year teacher. Um, I guess my question is, you know, how much like, hey, how you doing? You know, share a cheer or a fear or, you know, like just like kind of human connection. Should I be really focusing on doing as a part of each lesson because they're not going to get that in real life? Um, the last part is the only part I don't understand. You said they're not going to get that in real life. Like, but, um, you know, they can't socialize with a lot of their friends face to face, you know, for a multitude, a multitude of reasons. But um, okay. so, you know, I'm sure they're going to be excited to see a familiar face and ah, you know that kind of thing. Right, right, um, right. And so um, if you don't mind me asking two other questions, not that you need to tell me if you don't want to. What age do you teach? High school. High school age, um, freshman, sophomore, junior, or mix? Senior. A mix. And you're teaching what subject? Spanish. Oh, okay. Well, um, and so I'm guessing you've got introductory, intermediate, and advanced, you know, kind of mm -hmm. three, maybe four levels of Spanish. Um, so the first thing I'll tell you is that people do not learn when they're very anxious. Okay. Just throw mm -hmm. it out the window. So if the time that you spend greeting and interacting kind of in that, hello, how are you? Share a, what was it? Share a fear and a- A, a cheer or a fear. A cheer and a fear. I love that. Uh, how, many, how many students are in each of your classes? I mean, up to 32. So if everyone had a chance to share a cheer and a fear, your class would be more than half over, even if they were concise mm -hmm. or false, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was, uh, I was a, um, my undergraduate was in preschool teaching and certification K through eight. Um, but then I also taught a lot of high school kind of uh, substitute teacher kind of stuff. And, uh, but my, my experience with children in the classroom, unless you wanna say medical students or children, uh, is much less than yours. Mm -hmm. um, so I think of some logistical things because if, let's say, um, are there gonna be five sessions per week for your class? They had rolled out a block schedule this year for the first time. So most of the classes will be like 90 minutes. Okay. They're traditionally 50. Okay, good. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And how many uh, sessions per week? Each class will have two 90 minutes and then like a 30 minute, you know, kind of office hour or teachers are going to kind of handle that differently. Gotcha. So twice a week, you're going to meet with students for 90 minutes. Mm hmm. And when you, just so I know, 
when you typically ask for a cheer or fear, how many people, you know, raise, is everybody raising their hand or is it like half? See, I don't, I don't normally do it, um, but oh. I feel like it's really important <laughs> to do it because normally I, I, you know, I read their body language. I, I hear I, their tone, well, you know, that kind of stuff. And so they're going to be so two dimensional in front of me. But I, I mean, I want to let them know, like, yes, you're my student, but I, I know more than that you're a person and we've all been going through a lot for six months. Do you um, get to see them or can they turn off their camera? Well, they're supposed to be able to, they're supposed to turn on their camera at least initially, but then now the district is saying, well, some students are um, embarrassed of their home situation and don't want to right. have their camera up. Um, and so it could be like a quick snap kind of thing, um, right. which is not ideal. No, because you wanna, you wanna watch their facial expressions i think you're absolutely right and you want to be able to hear the the musicality of their language um to because that's what you're going to know it's a cue for who's in distress and who isn't and who can who can do the activities you might have with um meaningful involvement right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. having somebody you know give a cheer of fear if it's just a, a thing they're dreading and they're just throwing stuff out there i mean there's no you know, when I'd be teaching, if that were the occasion, I would find, try to find a different way for reaching that kiddo. I would rewrite it or talk to him in a different context. Because maybe Yeah, I think that I would also say, you know, you have an option to pass, but I just, right, right. I want to give you that option so, to share something. Right. And, and maybe you want to do, I don't know, you're, I agree, you're going to be kind of a first year, uh, everyone's a first year teacher this year in terms of virtual classroom. And, uh, therefore and every student it's their first time of doing this and unless mm -hmm. we're at the end of last year and that was different than this now because it's evolved into something different so i think giving everybody a little bit of latitude is is helpful i think if you were going to do the concept of a check-in cheer or fear would be an, one example of a check-in but there might be other other ways of doing check-in it's good, but when people bring up uh, intense material, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm going to, I'll tell you a story actually about an amazing woman in New York City, okay? And I'll tell you her name. Uh, and I'll tell you how I met her. Angela Coyle is her name. And Angela, later I'll tell you how I met her. Angela and a good friend of hers thought, wouldn't it be nice if children in uh, in the schools, and they were focused on the elementary schools, if children in the schools could learn um, the right skill set for good touch and bad touch. Simple thing, right? And so they said, hey, let's use a puppet show. And they got uh, donors and they got enough money and they went to the school system and they said, our goal is to go to every classroom and do our puppet show about good touch and bad touch. So kids know when they're having, uh, how to say no or how to ask for help and support. And it was all very wonderful. Um, but guess what happened? Somebody uh, said they'd been touched wrong. Yeah, way. Susie raises her hand and says, you know, my mom's boyfriend, my uncle, you know, cousin, whatever. And so all of a sudden they're getting all these disclosures, right? So Angela and her, um, her colleague um, said, well, darn, we should, we should go um, and get the resources to send these kids to the counseling services. But the counseling services is we're academic counselors. We don't do child abuse work. This is not mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. So they go, oh. So they went and wrote more grants and they got all those people trained and and disclosures and how to do referrals to child protective services. And so they started, this was the New York City Public Schools, no small event, right? No small group, it's the whole of the New York City Public Schools, which I think there's over a million children in the school system. Uh -huh. So, and I don't know, you know, I'm sure that elementary is fewer than that, but it's probably a lot of kids. 
and they'd already trained all these people. So then it, the, what they found is that nobody would prosecute. The DAs wouldn't prosecute these child abuse cases. So they went and got more money and they trained the DAs. And then guess what happened? I have no idea. <laughs> there weren't any laws. The laws weren't enough to protect the kids. Oh, the disclosures. Wow. So they went to Albany, New York, which is where the state house is. And they got two special laws passed for kids who disclose in school. And I thought this was an amazing person, but the way I met Angela Coyle was uh, I became involved with the New York City Fire Department after 9-11. And she had actually finished this whole chapter in her life I'm telling you about. And she, had, she, uh, she kind of turned this over to her colleague and stepped out of this on September the 10th, 2001. Gosh. And her brother, she had two brothers and a father who were firefighters. So as soon as she watched the towers go down, she immediately said, that's where I'm going. I'm gonna go help with that. So she came to help with the fire department. And what she saw was the firefighters were all getting a lot of help, but their families were not. So she created a system called the other side of the firehouse, which was for the children and the spouses of firefighters, especially mm. those who had lost no, I'm sorry, the ones who had lost a firefighter actually were also getting a lot of resources and therapy for their families. So um, it was the, all the firefighters and there was a bunch, there's a lot of firefighters in, in all of New York City and they weren't getting help. And so it was all about that. Mm -hmm. So a couple things I will tell you about what she figured out is when she decided to come up with things that were helpful for these families, she sent out a consent form and she put a sign up in the firehouse and it said, if you don't want your child or family involved in this, you have to sign out. Because if she said you have to sign in, they wouldn't have had any volunteers. Mm -hmm. But having to sign out added a step to not contacting families and it made all the difference. Mm. So I'm wondering if for your class, what you might want to do is pick half and half, you know, half to do this check in. If it's a, if it's a structured activity, if it's not a structured activity and you're like, Hey, how are you? But my, my the point of my conversation is you're going to have kids who begin if, if, if COVID really hits our town, like it has other towns and maybe it won't because we, we, We've done a lot of smart stuff in Ohio, um, but kids are going to begin to talk about people they know who are dying, and it might even be their grandparent, and they might have been in the room when it happened. And uh, there are some things like that that when they come up, it's it's you can't just say let's do all this in Spanish, you know. I mean, right. So you have to you have to have a sense of how much time they might use. And then have a sense of, do you need to reach out to that kid enough to do what we call safe handoff? Because you don't need to become the therapist. Mm -hmm. right? But but if we want to function well as a culture, and this is um, the work we do with the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, we go into schools where there's been shootings or uh, you know, maybe somebody's died in the school. People have witnessed that. We've gone to work with tornadoes and earthquakes and you know when the school is affected by that stuff fires and one of the things we really try to tell to the teachers because we're trying to help them with what to do to help their kids is don't feel like you have to learn to be a therapist just mm -hmm. just try to begin to have an awareness of when kids are in distress right there's stress and then there's distress and if they have distress then you refer up to the next level and this is going to be reinvented in the virtual world right this is, mm -hmm. this, is, this is something I suspect you're given that the schools haven't thought very much. Well, let me put this differently. Given that so many of the schools in the United States haven't shared with us how they've been thinking about this for a long time until of late, right? It's hard to know. I'm suspecting that your school and many other schools have not shared with you. What's your process when you have a kid who's in distress? Mm -hmm. Who are you supposed to talk to? Who's going to reach out to that kid? Who's going to reach out to that family? You know, there's a whole set of questions. What if a kid were to disclose that they were feeling suicidal? Well, you know, are you the one who's supposed to talk the parents into getting them support or who's going to call the, you know what I'm saying? 
So, so it's, these are important questions. As you go back to school, you might say, Hey, if I have a kid who tells me they're in distress, they're thinking about hurting themselves or someone just died, they really need counseling. What's the best way for me to make a referral to a part of our system that's designed for that classroom teaching is not designed for that, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be a kind of an early, um, watcher and a supporter of, of, you know, transfer. And what we call safe handoff. Mm-hmm. Was that okay. helpful? Or was that way too much? <laughs> no, I mean, in some ways it is too much, but isn't this whole situation too much? Um, well, it is too much. And forgive me, I'm going to say this, but I believe it to be true. You remember when they were talking about COVID probably going to be gone for the summer? Uh huh. That's because usually that's what influenza does, it ties down during the summer. What happens in the fall? Goes back up. The flu season. Mm-hmm. And that's going to mean the COVID season this year. So we're going to see an uptick in, in cases and how it's going to be transferred. Because people are going to be inside. And especially if we send kids back to school. And you have a reason to be concerned. And, you know, I've told a lot of people, if you can get your hands on a... on a, um, I like the KN95 mask a little better than the... They're, they're, they, make, they make an N, N95 that they say, hey, this is great at protecting you. And it is. The problem is if you have it, it doesn't protect other people because it has this little button on it and mm. you, your breath gets shot out the front. So unlike the crummy masks that we have now, at least that's what our hospital gives us, it's wide open on the side that protects other people. Uh, you want the N95s that don't have a button button makes it easier to breathe and and less uh, humidity for your glasses and such but they make an inexpensive like the 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 expensive n95s are now ten dollars a piece and they're kind of reserving those for healthcare workers the kn95s the reason they're different is they fit very tight around your your face and they protect you as the wearer as well Mm -hmm. as other people in the room and in my opinion, every school kid should have a KN95 because you can buy them on Amazon for like, I don't know, $10 will buy you a half dozen or more. Um, they're actually the, the mask, the preferred mask of China and they're made in China and they're, they're, they're top mm. one masks. But, you know, I think we should all be able to protect ourselves as well as each other. And I think that should have been figured out about mid-April. Are these like one, one use and done? No, you can wear them more than that. Any mask that isn't getting wet, torn, you know, or dirty. And I'll just show you. I think you guys are on my my screen, right? Mm-hmm. Let me go to, um, I'm just going, whoa. There's magical things happening with my, I, I'm not trying to open all those screens. But I'm going to write K in 95, and we'll see what they cost. Because that's, wow. Well, Lisa, I think you had something to say as well. I, I do. So, hi, Dr. Nelson, thank you. I really, this is very timely. But Kathleen, I actually wanted to say I've been in, in meetings with, I, I'm in Los Angeles and I'm the head of student services for a, a school here. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in um, meetings for the last two weeks with a consultant from Stanford on making these connections with kids. So, I have a couple. Quick Who is your consultant, if you mind me asking? Um, her name is uh, Claire, and I'm not going to be able to come up with her last oh, that's name. That's okay. I'm close <laughs> friends with Monpreet Singh, who's there, and also a guy named Shawshank. They're, they're, it's a really great department for suicide and, and, and trauma. She actually does. Um, she works on, um, she has for a long time worked specifically for online education. So she oh, is cool. in high demand right now. But one of the things she talks about is just, I mean, one of the things we all know is that our kids are lacking connection right now in a big way. And we, we've just been discussing for the, this this last week, how we can kind of foster some of those connections. And I wanted to tell you quickly, if I could, um, one was, you know, you have 30 kids, which is a lot more than our teachers have. But if you have, if you are able to do some kind of online um, or uh, worksheet check-in, and then follow up with those kids outside if you can, and mm-hmm. building that trust is what really can it creates that connection. So that was just some kind of way in order to, for you to have those kids feel like they're actually being seen 
and that there's it because as you know, the teachers who went in the fall and the spring that already had those connections, it was a lot easier. But when you're talking about a brand new class, it's right. hard to create those connections. So one of the things that was that we suggested was that we're suggesting for our teachers is that if they can do um, kind of a, a check-in, a roses and thorns or whatever kind of check-in and get that to kids before. And if they can actually reach out and connect with them individually, that's what we're encouraging them to do. That might be really hard for you. A second one would be like pairing them up. Um, so, because what they're lacking is a connection. It doesn't have to be with you. They're lacking a connection with other people in the class. Some of them are getting more of it than others, depending on how strict their parents are. LA is in a bad place right now. So we're really finding that kids are, are really lacking. So. Um, I would say if you can pair them with somebody else in the classroom for a connection, the breakout groups are mm -hmm. really encouraging um, kids to talk just like you, like there's only a few of us on this call. So we're really able to talk together. But when you have a group of 30, then people right. feel like they're really not hurt at all. And um, then the other thing, as far as the background goes, because there is a lot of studies and I know from, I, I just came from a, a very a prominent boarding school on the East Coast. And they, what they do is, uh, so what the kids do sometimes is they kind of increase the division by what they put behind them for how much of their room they show, by how much of their house they show. And because of that, one of the suggestions that we're gonna give our teachers is to come up with three backgrounds that they can live with and then let their students vote on which background goes in the room so that then there, there is a common background and it's not distracting, but then there's also an ability to change the background. So maybe kids submit the backgrounds, the teacher, you know, you would come up with the three that you can live with and then, um, and then the kids can vote on which one of those three. So and that's nice because a couple, connect, a couple little suggestions. Yeah, that, that addresses the concern about, I don't, I don't want people seeing where I'm embarrassed, you know. Mm -hmm whether yeah. they're affluent or poor or whatever we might imagine, you know, people can be embarrassed for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, those are great ideas. Well, well, Dr. Nelson, thank you for being with us tonight and everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank I you. hope you found this yeah. helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. A special thank you to our state of mind speakers and to you for joining us. More videos and educational resources can be found at One in Five's website. If you feel like you or your child is in need of professional support, therapists are available. Please refer to MindPieces school-based or community resource page. For a mental health crisis or emergencies, patients and families are encouraged to contact their current mental health provider first. This allows the mental health provider who knows your child best to provide support and direction. If your child does not have a mental health provider and they are experiencing a non-life-threatening mental health crisis, you are encouraged to contact the Psychiatric Intake Response Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. 513-636-4124. Call 911 or go to the emergency department if you are experiencing a medical emergency, a life-threatening mental health crisis, or are directed to go there by a medical provider. This will help limit the spread of COVID-19 in our community and allow our emergency departments to care for patients with the most critical needs first.